As a soldier, a ruler, and a human being, he was a person of phenomenal attributes. The hero of hundreds of battles was the person who, for 20 years, braved the storm of the Crusaders and ultimately pushed them back. The world has hardly witnessed a more chivalrous and humane conqueror. His unmatchable battle tactics and gallantry as a soldier Heroic statementship and his strength of character won him the respect of even his foes. Known for liberating the holy city of Jerusalem from the Crusaders, his chivalrous behavior was noted by Christian chroniclers, especially in the accounts of the siege of Karak and Moab. And despite being the nemesis of the Crusaders, he won the respect of many of them including Richard the Lionheart. Rather than becoming a hated figure in Europe, he became a celebrated example of the principles of chivalry. At the height of his power, he ruled over Egypt, Syria, Mesopotamia, Hejaz, and Yemen. We all know how he laid waste to the Crusaders and had them chasing their tails in the battles of Alexandria, Hittin, Acre, Tyre, Beirut, Nablus, Haifa, Tiberias, Gaza, Asqalan, Jerusalem, and dozens of other cities and towns across Sham and North Africa. The great Salahuddin al Ayyubi. But who was the man behind the armor? What was he like as a person? What was he like as a Muslim? What personality does it take to carry out such heroic feats and achieve such a status? Born in Tikrit, Iraq in 1137 AD, Salahuddin spent his childhood memorizing the Quran, learning the Islamic sciences as well as poetry. His father Ayyub was the governor of Baalbek. In his youth, Salahuddin learned his military tactics from his uncle, Asad ad-Din Shirkuh, and was mentored by Sultan Nur ad-Din, who inspired Salahuddin to unite the Muslim Ummah. Salahuddin went on to capture Egypt from the Fatimids and Syria from the Zengids uniting the Muslim lands together and became known as the Sultan of Egypt. And under Salahuddin's rule, Egypt flourished. He revitalized the economy, expanded the military, and built many great schools. Education became a cornerstone of the new Egypt, and it soon became viewed as an intellectual center of learning and thus Salahuddin brought new life to the once ailing province. Soon after, Salahuddin's mentor, Nur ad-Din, passed away in Damascus. At this point in time, the situation in Damascus was precarious. Leadership had been passed to Nur ad-Din's son, Al-Malik al-Salih Ismail, who was a mere child of 11 years. Division and conflict over authority prevailed, and the situation was worsening by the day. The leaders and public of Damascus eventually saw the volatility of their situation, and with various parties being potential claimants to the throne, requested for Salahuddin to take authority over them. Just as in Egypt, Salahuddin's ruler allowed Damascus to stabilize and started to prosper. With the death of the young Al-Malik As-Salih Ismail, Salahuddin gained a firm hand over Syria and thus successfully united most of the regions under his command. Salahuddin used diplomacy and administrative skill in piecing together an ummah divided. And in doing so, he became the most powerful figure in the Muslim world. All the while, 
the Crusaders watched on, but probably did not appreciate the significance of the consolidation taking place. After a few encounters against with Crusader forces, a shaky truce was declared between Muslims and the Christian kingdom with its capital in Jerusalem. This truce though was not to last and Salahuddin was aware that there would come at some point a trigger allowing him to play in his hand. The influencing Christian knight Reynald of Châtillon betrayed the terms of the truce deal, attacking a Muslim caravan going to Hajj, launching a fleet of ships in the Red Sea, and disrupting trading routes that Salahuddin and the Christians had agreed would be kept open. The most unacceptable of all Reynald's actions were his threats to attack Mecca and Medina, and his insults against the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Upon hearing of this, Salahuddin was furious. The audacity of Reynald was too much for Salahuddin to ignore, and he swore to slay him by his own hand. The advent of Reynald's actions was the trigger Salahuddin needed. Salahuddin led the Muslims to the decisive Battle of Hattin, which took place in the month of July 1187. For the first time, the Kingdom of Jerusalem was encircled by Muslim territory, united under one commander. Salahuddin this time had a well-prepared army ready to face the mighty alliance of Guy of Lusignan, the King of Jerusalem, Reynald, and other Christian knights and leaders. In a move indicative of his military acumen, Salahuddin deprived the Crusader army of access to water reducing the soldiers to a tired and unorganized mess. The crusaders were humiliated, many being taken prisoner, most prominent among them being Reynald of Châtillon and Guy of Lusignan. Salahuddin ordered both Guy and Reynald be brought to his tent. Salahuddin invited Guy to sit beside him, and when Reynald entered, he seated him next to his king and reminded him of his misdeeds. How many times have you sworn an oath and violated it? How many times have you signed agreements you have never respected? Reynald answered through a translator, Kings have always acted thus. I did nothing more. Historians note that during this time, King Guy was gasping with thirst, his head dangling as though drunk his face betraying great fright. Salahuddin spoke reassuring words to him, had cold water brought and offered it to him. The king drank, then handed what remained to Reynald, who quenched his thirst in turn. Salahuddin then said to Guy, you did not ask permission before giving him water. I am therefore not obliged to grant him mercy. After pronouncing these words, Salahuddin smiled mounted his horse and rode off, leaving the captives in fear. He supervised the return of the troops and then came back to his tent. He ordered Reynald brought there, then advanced before him, sword in hand, and struck him between the neck and the shoulder blade. Guy began to tremble. Seeing him like this, Salahuddin said to him in a reassuring tone, this man was slain only because he exceeded all bounds. King Guy was spared and was taken to Damascus for a time, then allowed to go free. Three months after the Battle of Hattin, Salahuddin besieged and subsequently captured Jerusalem. Unlike the Crusaders 88 years earlier, who made Jerusalem a bloodbath during the First Crusade, Salahuddin did none of that. He entered the city, not as a boastful conqueror, but with humility, just like the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him did when he entered Mecca. Salahuddin was in a position to seek revenge on the very people that shed the blood of thousands of innocent Muslims during the first crusades. However, just like the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him promised safety and peace to his aggressors, 
Salahuddin also did the same to the Christians of Jerusalem. When he took the city, Salahuddin forbade any massacres or plundering of Christians, Frankish or Oriental. He even strengthened the guards at their churches and gave them permission to return for their pilgrimages. He granted them 40 days to safely leave the city along with their property and belongings. Part of the conditions of surrender was to pay ransom for their freedom. Salahuddin set the ransom at a low price so everyone could pay. And for those who couldn't, Salahuddin paid for the ransom from his own wealth. When the patriarch of the city took chariots full of gold, carpets, and precious goods from the city, Salahuddin's advisors were outraged. I said to the Sultan, this patriarch is carrying off riches worth at least 200,000 dinars. We gave them permission to take their personal property with them, but not the treasures of the churches and convents. But Salahuddin answered, we must apply the letter of the accords we have signed so that no one will be able to accuse the believers of having violated their treaties. On the contrary, Christians everywhere will remember the kindness we have bestowed upon them. This amazing example is a testament to the character of Salahuddin, as well as his God consciousness and forward thinking. It's his generosity and justice that earned him the respect of his later opponent. King Richard the Lionheart during the Third Crusades, as author Amin Malouf described it, Salah ad had conquered Jerusalem, not to amass gold, and still less to seek vengeance. His prime objective, as he himself explained, was to do his duty before God and his faith. It's mentioned that al muwaffaq Abdul Latif said, I went to Salah ad while he was in Jerusalem, and I saw a king who filled eyes with amazement and hearts with love whether they were near or far. He was an easygoing person, likable, and his companions used to try to imitate him, racing towards good actions. The first night I spent with him, I found his gatherings filled with scholars engaged in knowledge. He would listen intently and participate in their discussions. He would learn how to build walls and dig trenches, and he would then do this himself carrying the rocks on his own shoulders. Despite the best efforts, the Crusaders could not retake Jerusalem. Battles were fought between the Muslims and the Crusaders. But overall, a stalemate ensued. Salah ad was unable to force Richard the Lionheart to retreat and Richard was unable to breach Salah ad defenses. With no advancement by either side, a treaty was signed. Under the terms of the treaty, Jerusalem would remain in Muslim hands, but Christian pilgrimages would be allowed. Ibn Kathir said that at the time of his death, Salah ad hardly had any money in his possession, and this is because of the immense number of gifts and charity and kindness that he used to show the leaders and ministers under his command, and even to his enemies. And he was very simple in his clothing, food, drink, and transportation. It is not known that he ever approached anything forbidden or discouraged, especially after Allah blessed him with his kingdom. Rather, his greatest concern and goal was to aid Islam. Ibn Kathir continued, and he was very strict in praying on time in jama'ah, even during the illness of his death. The Imam would enter and lead him in prayer, and he would struggle to get up and pray despite his weakness. And he loved to hear the recitation of the Quran and the reading of a hadith and knowledge. He was constant and habitual in listening to a hadith being read to him, to the point that he would hear a section read to him while he was standing between the ranks of soldiers. He would enjoy doing this and say, Nobody listens to a hadith in a situation like this. Abu Ja'far al-Qurtubi said, 
that when Salah ad-Din was on his deathbed, I finished reciting the Quran at the verse, He is Allah, besides whom there is none worthy of worship, the knower of the unseen and the seen. And I heard Salah ad-Din saying, this is true. And he was in a coma before this. He then died. In Al-Khatib, Ad-Dawla'i washed his body. He was brought out in a coffin. And Muhyiddin bin Az-Zingi prayed over him. He was then returned to the room in the garden where he had been sick and was buried in a kiosk. Voices were raised and crying. And it became so loud that even the smart one would think that the whole world was screaming in a single voice. The people were so overwhelmed that some of them were distracted from praying over him. People expressed the remorse at his passing, including the Crusaders, due to how truthful and trustworthy he was. Ad-Dahabi said, and I never saw a king whose death people were sad for except him. This is because he was loved by everyone. He was loved by the righteous and the wicked, the Muslims and the disbelievers.